Hi everybody, Scott Stanchfield here. Let's go ahead and start implementing our movie application. Ooh. We're going to try to enhance our existing application that we had with Room to actually put a real GUI in front of it. What I've done is I started a new project called Movies 1, and I copied over all of the code from the Room example, and I updated the build scripts. So I'm using the common build scripts that I have for all the other uh, projects in the sample repository. Let's take a quick peek in there. So in the settings.gradle, we're going to be pulling in that libs.versions.toml to make sure I have the latest versions of things. Uh, I'm applying from movies.gradle, or modules.gradle, which just says include app. There'll be some examples later on where we have multiple modules, but for this we just need the one module. The top level build.gradle, pretty common stuff. It's basically saying just to use that that class path uh, bundle, the, the plugins bundle that I set up inside that, uh, that TOML file. And then in the app level build script, we're going to be including the dependencies in those different bundles that are defined in the TOML, TOML, as well as setting up the Android support, the common Android support there. So we have the movies application that we're doing here, the different versions of the SDK that we're using, the Kotlin annotation processing tool to handle our room annotations there, and everything else in here is pretty standard. So now that we have the build all set up, I'm just going to run it to see what we have so far. And we'll see on the emulator here, this was the application we had so far. We've got the database dumping information. I can select movies, and it shows the cast, and so on. So what I want to do now is start creating a real user interface using Jetpack Compose here that'll look more like an application should. So it'll give you a list of movies up front that you can tap on, take you to a display page, you can go to an edit page from there, and so on. So let's start off by creating a movie list. Let's go to our, our main activity here, and let's actually create a new Kotlin file that I'm going to call UE. I mean, that might be too general because I don't want to put necessarily everything in the same file. Well, I guess I will for this example. So we'll say UE. It's going to be a file. And this is where we're going to have all of our composables sit. And this will describe our different user interfaces. So kind of at the top level, the main composables we're going to have. We're going to have a fun movie list. We're going to have a movie display. and a movie edit. Then we're also going to have actor edit and actor display. That way we can actually look at the actors. Now we could do an actor list as well so we could work from that angle. Let's go ahead and throw him in as well. We might not implement all these if I don't implement them in this video, I will add them in after. It just kind of depends on how long the video runs. The logic and the operation of each of these is going to be very similar to how the movie stuff works. So if we get there, we get there. If we don't, we don't. So let's start taking a look and think about what we need to pass into a movie list. So I'd like to actually get a list of movies and pass that in. Just kind of like that. And then for a movie display, we're going to need a movie. And for a movie edit, we're going to need a movie as well. For an actor list, we're going to need a list of actors. For an actor edit, we're going to need just a single actor. And an actor display. We're going to need an actor as well. So that's be, those are our main inputs. We may need a few other things there to make things work. But to start with, we'll just deal with that. Now, what we saw in the basic Compose example was I was just cycling through the list of movies and dumping them out as text. We really don't want to do that because the list could be pretty long, and we don't want to have to add extra nodes to the tree that aren't really necessary. So what we're going to do is use something called a lazy column. And a lazy column will create and remove things on the fly based on their keys. Now with a movie, we have an ID that acts as a unique identifier for each movie. So if we use that key to represent each row in this list that we're displaying, then when things come and go, Jetpack Compose can decide 
if it's already got something in memory that it can reuse. So let's take a look at what this guy is going to look like. So to start with, we're going to put in a lazy column here. So inside this lazy column, we're going to need some items. So I'm going to say items, and we're going to pick one that actually has items as an argument. And inside here, I can say items equals movies. And then we're going to need a key. And the key is going to be the movie ID. And then we're going to have the actual content for that item showing up on the screen. So we're going to describe this using a little card that's going to have some rounded rectangles and then some content on top of it. One of the pieces of content is going to be an icon. So let's define an icon. I'm going to go to source main res drawable underneath our app and say new vector asset. And let's take a look at our clip art. And if I come up here and say movie, there happens to be a nice little movie icon here we can use. And I'll finish that one off. So we now have that icon we can use in a little bit there. Now we're going to set up a little card inside here. So I'm going to say card and we'll import him. And we're going to have, first of all, an elevation of 2 dp. So it's going to look like it's raised a little bit. Let's give it a background color. And we can say material theme dot colors dot surface. So it'll be just whatever the common surface color is, the background type color for the theme that's currently defined. And that's really nice because that'll change depending on what we need there. Now I'm going to make it have a rounded co corner shape here. Let me get the emulator out of the way so you have a little more room. So I'm going to say rounded corner shape. And we'll say corner equals corner size 16.dp. So we'll give it a nice little radius there for you know, some space around that corner. Now the modifier is going to get a little more complex as we start dealing with the way you click on it. But for right now, we're just going to start off with some simple spacing. So I'm going to say modifier dot padding. And we'll give it a 8dp padding around it. And we're going to give it a fill max width parameter there. Just make it span out the entire limit width there. So go ahead and put in a little body for what's inside the card. And why is this complaining about padding? Unresolved reference padding. Ah, I do this all the time. What I ended up doing is I imported the wrong type of modifier, Java Lang, Java Lang Reflect modifier. And this is something to be careful about when you're using multiple frameworks at the same time. We happen to be using Java behind the scenes here, so Java Lang Reflect modifier is in scope. So what I want to do is kill that import. Let's just make sure we import the right one. We want to get the Android X Compose UE modifier. And now, voila, that's just fine. Uh, sometimes error messages help. Uh, that's one that is probably going to happen to you at some point or other. So thankfully it came up, so you'll see how to deal with it. So simple little card definition of how it's going to be shaped on the screen and spaced out and things like that. Let's actually put some stuff inside of it now. So now inside of here, let's have a row to represent the main part of our actual user interface here. And what I'd like to do is everything in this row, I'd like to kind of center it vertically so that I can have the center of the image line up with the center of the text next to it. So I'm going to come in here and say vertical alignment equals alignment center vertically. And that'll make sure that my image and my text have a common center line across them. So now I'm going to have an image in here and then I'm going to have a text next to it. And let's just import those. And we need to define what the actual image is. So the thing that we're going to draw on the screen, we're going to use what's called a painter to draw that. So I'm going to say painter equals painter resource and specify the actual ID of that icon that we just defined. So r.drawable.baselineMovieGuy. guy. So that's going to be our little movie icon showing up on there. There's a couple other things we're going to do with it later. We're going to set up a color filter on it to tint it to a certain uh, uh, color. Let's actually do that to start with, but we'll make it more complex in a, in a minute here. So we're going to start off with color filter dot tint, and we're going to say 
material theme dot colors dot on surface. So this is going to be the default way we want to put stuff on top of a surface. And that's going to be nice for some contrast there. So now we get the color filter set up. Let's give it a content description. So just in case somebody wants to use a screen reader to, to read the screen to them. And we're going to use a string resource for that. And it'll be r dot string dot and let's actually define a string for that. I might be able to actually do it. Let me try here. So we'll say movie icon. And let's see if it will let us not there. Let's see if I can do it without. There we go. So without selecting it, hit Alt Enter and it'll give you the extract string resource. And then I can just say movie icon. And that'll create that string for me. And then finally, a little modifier for this for spacing and things. So modifier, let's give it some padding. 8.dp is a decent standard pad padding. We want to explicitly specify its size as 48dp. 48dp is a typical thumb size. It makes it really easy for somebody to tap. And then we want to make it clickable. Now we're not going to do anything with that yet. I'm just going to put a little to do deal with clicking icon so we can fill that detail a little bit later. So next, the text. Come down here and we'll say text equals some way of getting the actual text from the item. So what do we have coming in here? Now this lambda for the items actually has two parts to it. The this, that's the receiver of that lambda, is the lazy item scope, which gives us access to some functions that we might need to help inform the, the column how we're going to deal with it. But it also comes with an argument to that lambda. And that argument's the actual item, the movie. So if we look at that movie there, it's going to walk through all these items, and anytime it needs to create an item to display on the screen, it's going to use this lambda to, to create it. That way it can create only the stuff that it actually needs. So now that we have that, I can say movie.title. And we'll just display the movie title on the screen there. Now we're going to want to give it a color as well. So I'm going to say color equals material theme dot, whoops, colors dot on surface. So the same, it's going to be the same color as that icon showing up there. So this should give us a basic list of movies that we can display on the screen. We haven't handled the clicking here, nor have we handled the clicking at the overall uh, item level, so this, the whole card. We're going to be putting in another click handler up here, but it's a much more complex click handler because of the types of clicks we're going to do. We're going to handle a long press and a normal press. So let's try using this movie list and see if we actually get a movie list out of it. Let's go up to the main activity, and in here, Instead of calling this UE, let's just comment the rest of this stuff out for the moment. And then I'm going to come up here and let's just have a movie list. And we're going to pass in movies. Now to do that, we need to get the movies. So actually, let's create a, a UE function here. So composable fun UE. And we're going to pass in our movie view model. and then construct a UE out of it. Now we have the view model up here already. Let's just pass that in there. So the view model. And then down here, we're going to collect those movies so we can display them on the screen. So I'm going to say val movies by view model dot movies dot collect as state. And initially it's just going to be an empty list. So this will actually give me movies I can work with, and I can just say movie list movies equals movies. And hopefully this will actually work. Let's go ahead and run this and see if we get a nicer looking list out of this now. Ta-da! So now we have a list that has little cards that have a little movie icon and some text on it. And right now, the cards don't handle clicks, but if I click on the icons, 
it's going to go and execute whatever the uh, the code was for that icon. Turns out, if we go to Logcat, we're going to see an exception thrown here. And it says, an operation is not implemented, deal with clicking icon. So that to-do function that we called forcibly throws an exception just to let us know that we haven't implemented that yet. If we had just made that a dummy open function, we might forget to implement it at some point. This kind of sticks it out in our face there. So, so far we have a nice little list that we can deal with. Let's go ahead and think about how we can click on an item and what that'll do. So, if we go back to our UE, when we have this movie list, so we'll say movie selection, there's a few things we want to keep in mind. We want to, first of all, be able to just tap on something. So tap to open it, and that'll display it. We also want to be able to tap icon or long press to start multi-selection. And multi-selection is important because you may want to select multiple items in the list and then be able to delete them or do some other action. For our application, we're going to have a delete function where you can long press an item to go into multi-select or tap on an icon to go into multi-select. And then further taps add things to that multi-selection or remove them. So further whoops, taps add to remove from the selection. Now we're going to hold off on this part for right now. We're going to concentrate just on the movement of the application from the list screen to the display screen to the edit screen to start with. So this will be later on functionality. But for right now, let's deal with tapping to open it. Now we currently have that icon having a clickable. I'm going to comment that out just so we, if we tap on it, we don't accidentally crash. But we'll come back to that. The main thing we want to do is say if we click anywhere on the card, then that click should be considered opening something. Now, that means we're going to need some way of telling the outside world that we wanted to open something. So let's come in here and say on click, which is going to be a function that takes a movie, it's going to be the movie that was clicked, and do something with it. So we don't know what's going to be done with it. It's just they're not going to return any value. We don't need a value back from it. So we need to deal with that for the card. Be careful on where you put that clickable with the modifier. If I put it after this dot padding, then it'll only allow you to click within that nested area so that the eight pixels around the edge of it will be dead. So what I really want to do is at the top here is say clickable. And later on, we're going to change this to handle long presses. But for now, we'll just deal with normal clicks. And we'll just call on click. And we have to click which movie is actually being represented there. That'll be this guy right up here because that's the movie that we've created for this card. There we go. So now we have a nice way to know when a movie was clicked. Let's tweak our user interface slightly so that when a movie is clicked, we display its, its description up at the top of the screen. So in here I have, that's my user interface I've created. Let's have a column, which is going to have the movie list in it, but above it, is going to have a text where text equals description. And let's say var description by remember. And inside here, actually, let's make this movie. So this will be the selected movie. And it will be mutable state of movie question mark passing in a null. So we're going to allow this state to have a nullable movie with it. And what I need to do is, impl is import that set value. So I'm going to hit Alt Enter, pull that in. And we should have a set value and get value now for that guy. So now what I need to do is, and this will be selected movie dot description but remember selected movie could be null so I can say question mark dot and put an Elvis on the end here and say no movie selected and let's alt enter 
extract string resource. No movie selected. And now we have a little text field at the top that's going to tell you if a movie is selected or not, and if so, what its description is. Because that lambda or the function being passed in is the last argument to the movie list, I can put the lambda outside the parens, and here is the what to do when a movie is selected. So I can just say selected movie equals it. Now we're eventually going to want to move this type of stuff into the view model, but for this little quick example, it'll work well here. So let's give this a try, see how this works. It says no movie selected, and if I click on each of these, it's now showing me the movie description. And notice when I click, it's actually showing the highlight there. Now it turns out the way that's implemented really just deals with the whole rectangle here. When you click it, you can see the entire rectangle. We want it to be handled inside that curve, which is a parameter inside of the card. So if we go down and look at that again, when we define this card, instead of using clickable here, they added in an on click to the actual card itself, which can understand the elevation, background color, shape, all that type of thing to work within it. So I'm going to move this up here and get rid of clickable down here. And what is he complaining about now? The material API is experimental and likely to change or be removed in the future. So let's see, this is experimental. We're going to want to, and this probably will change between videos. Hopefully I won't have to redo this video. Uh, I'm going to say add experimental material API, and hopefully that'll work. If it doesn't, go ahead and use the clickable down here in the, the modifier, and that'll be fine. I'll try to post some information if I see that change over, over the years. Of course, I'll have to redo these videos in a year anyway, but... Uh, okay, so let's try running it now and see if that looks a little better. And I'll click on it. And now you'll see that it only clicks inside the bounds. That looks so much nicer. So we now have it telling us when it's selected something. So what I'd like to do is have that open up a different screen. There's a few concerns we have to deal here. One, we have to know which screen we're on, and we need to be able to navigate between them. When we go to a screen, we really want to push it on a stack so that we can go back to the previous screen, wherever he came from. So we're going to have to think about that part of our application state here. Let's go and look at our movie view model. And inside of here, I want to deal with the where am I state. So let's do that using sealed interface. And I will call this screen to say which screen we're actually on. And then we're going to have some implementations of that. So we're going to have a object movie list screen. And we can do it as an object because it doesn't really matter what uh, movie was selected. It's like this will just represent the movie list for whatever happens to be selected there. And there's a couple ways I can deal with the individual display screen and the edit screen. I could have an object here or a class here that keeps track of which movie it is. Or I could have an object and then let the data in the view model drive that. Let's go ahead and put it inside of a class for right now. I'm going to say class movie display, and he's going to have a val movie movie, and he is going to be a screen. And if I float over this, what's the issue? Conflicting overloads, oh, because I have a function called movie display. Let's explicitly call this movie display screen for the data that represents where we are, and movie list screen. And let's do the same thing. I guess I can just collapse him for the movie edit screen. And then I can do the same thing for actors if I want. So actor list screen, actor display screen, actor edit screen. And it's going to be actor, actor, actor. So this defines all of our screens in our application. We'll just need to import him. 
So now I need to keep track of where we are. And the simplest way to do that is to just go ahead and use a list to keep track of where we are and add some operations for push and pop. Now there is a navigation component that you can use with this. And honestly, I am not a fan of it because a lot of the keeping track of where you are is all, is all URL based. And it feels kind of awkward. It's useful if you have a, uh, you want to be able to jump into a subscreen directly from outside of your application. Like let's suppose that you have a mail application that you're writing and you get a new email. There's a notification saying you have new email. When you tap on the new email, you might want to jump right to that specific email. So using a URL for that, where you'd have you know, the, the name of your application slash the uh, actual email ID, that would be a good idea. For this application, or for a lot of applications, you don't necessarily need these deep links. And it becomes, I think, harder to do the navigation using the navigation framework and all this support for just having URL strings. So instead, I'm going to manage this with a, a uh, stack directly. You can do it this way, or you can try the navigation component. I really recommend you just try this way for most applications. Uh, it's just so much simpler, and then you can see what's going on. You don't have this black box of navigation, which tends to cause a few issues here and there. So let's take a look inside here and create a nice little stack of things. So I'm going to say private val. Uh, let's see, backstack. And this is going to be a mutable list of, actually, let's make it a var and just have it be a list. So list of, make it an, and we want to have whatever our first screen is here. Make sure we say screen and movie list. So we're going to start off, oh, movie list screen. We're going to start off with only the movie list screen on that back stack. And let's add some functions to be able to handle him. So we're going to say stack manipulation. We're going to have a fun push screen. So if we're going to push a screen on here, then what we're going to do is say back stack equals back stack plus screen. That's pretty straightforward. If we're going to pop a screen, we're going to say backstack equals backstack dot drop last one. So we're just going to omit the last item on the screen. And what we're also going to want to do here is whenever we push something on the screen, we're going to want to update a flow to say what the current item is. So let's create a flow up here. I'm going to say private val current screen. And the private version of this, we're going to mark with an underscore on the end. This is basically the one that we can edit inside of our movie view model. And so I'm going to have this be a mutable shared flow of screen. It's just going to be a single screen that we're dealing with. And we'll just close him up there. And then we're going to expose that just as a flow. So anybody outside of the view model can't actually modify it. They actually have to ask us to push or pop to make this change. So we're going to say val current screen colon flow screen. Make sure you implement the right flow here. It's going to be the one from Kotlin coroutines flow equals current screen. So you're going to see this pairing quite a bit in different types of Android code or in, jo in Kotlin code in general. You may have a mutable thing that's managed by this class and you would use that underscore syntax to keep track of it. And then you have the non-mutable one that's going to be accessed outside of this class. And you're just going to expose it as a flow screen. Now we could go a step further and actually wrap this in a, uh, a non-mutable flow. I don't want to do that here. Somebody outside could get sneaky and actually cast it to a mutable shared flow. But we're trying to really, from an API perspective, protect it. In this particular example, we're not going to really hardwire this to make sure that nobody can cheat. Um, we're really trying to make sure that they don't accidentally do something that they don't want to do. So that gives us our current screen. And what we're going to do is anytime we push or pop, we want to set that current screen. So I'm going to say current screen underscore dot emit. We're going to send off a value there. And that value is going to be, well, actually, I want to do a uh, 
that value equals. And I just realized that's not working because I actually have the wrong kind of flow here. I said mutable, mutable shared flow. I meant mutable state flow. which just keeps track of one item at a time. A shared flow in general can have more than one item behind it. Now this is also going to ask me to pass in the initial value. So movie list screen comes in there. That's better. So now down here I can say screen.value equals backstack dot first or null. Now I want to do this because if you pop the last thing off, that's considered exiting the application. The, bat, the current screen would be null, the activity will see that, and then exit the application. But that means the current screen actually has to be able to hold a null. So let's go up to him and make that nullable. So now we can actually return a null from that. Now there's a little bit of a difference between calling dot value and calling dot emit. If I come in here, I could also call dot emit on that flow but notice that I get an error because this is a suspend function, which means I would have to make my push a suspend function, which means it could only run in a coroutine. And we don't necessarily want that. If you call set value, it's actually going to be able to manage setting it regardless which, uh, co if you run a coroutine or not. So I'm just going to set the value. We'll do the same thing down here again, set him up, and boom. Now we can also automate this a little bit more by using the setter of the backstack and say anytime the backstack changes, we're going to automatically do this. So I'm going to do that by taking that code, coming up to backstack, and saying whenever we set it, first I'm going to say field equals value. So I'll actually set the backing field of this guy. And then I'm going to set the current screen value to, we can say, value first or null. Boom! This is really nice because now it's completely automated. No matter how the backstack changes, I'm always going to set current screen. So if I end up adding other code in here that modifies the backstack, this takes care of keeping the backstack and the current screen in sync. So now we need to have the activity keep track of that current screen. Let's go back to our UE in here. And for our UE class, oh, which I did inside the main activity, this guy is going to need to do the same kind of collection for the current screen. And except the initial one, well, we're going to have this be current screen, and the initial is going to be movie list screen. So now we have a current screen available to us, and we can choose what we want to display. So down here in our column, but well, we're actually not going to use the column, down here in our main code, I'm going to say when selected, whoops, uh, current screen, and let's fill in the details. So I'm going to go up here and hit Alt Enter and say add remaining branches. Boom. And it's filling in all the options that we have for different screens. I'm going to leave the actor stuff as to do move my movie list screen up, move my actor list screen up. And down here, if the current screen is null, I want to get out of the application. So up here, I'm going to say on exit, pass me in a function. So if I see a null in my stack, I'm going to say on exit. Call him. So now the caller can just do whatever he needs to exit the user interface exit the application actually. So now I'm going to take my movie list, put that up here, and let's get rid of this column and the description thing. We don't need that anymore. Still going to keep my selected movie. And what does he not like here? Oh, because he now has that experimental API, we need to declare that the caller has the experimental API. him up there. And that's going to mean whoever calls Yui, he needs to do the same thing. And I'm just going to add it to the activity in general there so it covers. If I tried to add it on create, it wouldn't like that because the super class on create doesn't have that annotation on it. And we need to fill in 
that on back and inside here if we have a back I'm just going to call or on exit I'm just going to call finish which exits the application well it exits the activity but that'll end up ex exiting the application so there's my movie list we're gonna do the same kind of thing for the movie display screen and movie edit screen so we'll say movie display screen or just movie display passing in movie equals when because we are looking at the current screen and seeing its value here we need to actually capture it up here so we'll say val screen equals so this is going to take a snapshot of the current screen which could be changing behind the scenes because of this collected state by taking that snapshot I can get a smart cast out of this so inside here I can just say screen dot movie because it'll automatically cast it to movie display because it knows inside here that the screen has to be a, a movie display. The problem with just saying current screen here is that by the time I check it here and by the time I use it here, a new value could have been set. So we don't want to do that. So that's movie display. Let's do the same type of thing for movie edit down here. And then we can do the same thing for the actor list whoops say actors equals actors and he doesn't have a function being passed in we need to set up our actors here just like we had our movies And then these two guys, we can do the same thing as we did for the edit. Actor edit, actor equals screen dot actor. And this one actually should be actor display. So there's our basic structure that we're going to have at this UE level. The UE level is going to take in the view model, pull the stuff out that it needs, and then call the individual screens based on which screen should be displayed. So let's change this now. Instead of saying selected movie equals it, let's go ahead and just push that on the stack. So I'm going to say view model dot push movie display screen passing in the movie. And that should now allow me to go to that movie display screen. But we also need to handle back. So we need to tell compose that any time the back button is pressed we need to go to that view model and pop the stack so let's come up here and wherever we want inside of the set content I'm just going to say back handler and the on back is going to say view model dot pop and actually that shouldn't have an argument there we go so anytime back is pressed the default action here is to hop out to the previous screen. Now, hopefully, if we've done this right, we should be able to navigate between the movie uh, list screen and the movie edit screen, or the movie display screen, which currently doesn't do anything. But let's see how that looks. So here's our list of movies. I'm going to click on the transporter. And absolutely nothing happened. So let's take a look at what we have here. So we have the current screen. View model push. Let's see what he's doing there. We say back stack equals back stack plus screen. The back stack is setting the field and then changing the current screen value, which should go back to our main activity. That looks good, which should get the current screen and then update things here. So let's throw a breakpoint in here. I'm going to throw a breakpoint on this when, and hopefully we'll see when this gets called and what the different values are. I'm going to hit the debugger up here. Let's step over that line just so we can see what it's actually doing. So screen is movie list screen. That's good so far. 
and I hit continue. And now step over, screen is still movie list screen, continue. Let's take a look at what we have displayed. Boom, that all looks good. Let's click on the transporter. And it looks like the click actually isn't doing anything. So maybe I did the same thing I did before. Let's just double check that. Go to my UE, have our movie list. And in the card, I say on click, uh, call on click with the movie. So that looks like that should be OK. Let's just see if that's being called from here. Throw a breakpoint inside there. And let's debug. Click on him. So it's actually calling this. That's good. Let's go inside of that function. We're saying backstack. It was backstack plus screen. Oh, okay. The problem I had is the way I was defining the current. I said it's a first or null instead of last or null. Silly me. Makes you want the, the last thing that was pushed onto the stack. Now if we do this, it'll work just fine. This is what we say is works as coded. It's not a bug, it just works as the way I coded it. Click on transporter. Now we're on that screen. There's nothing there. If I go back, I come back to here. If I hit back again, I exit the application. So far, so good. Let's define our movie display screen. So back in our UE, we now want to display the information on the movie here. So I'm going to pull over that common helper file that we had paste it in here and inside here I don't think we need this box text we can use the label that we defined and a little uh, text for it to display something let's go ahead and use that I'm gonna go back to my UE and inside here I'm gonna start off by having a column and I want this to be scrollable just in case I don't have enough space to display it it's usually a good idea to have the base content of your screen be scrollable so that if they have a really small screen or if they rotate it, they can still see all the information. So I'm going to say modifier vertical scroll. Remember scroll state. And that should make it so it's scrollable. And then I can have label. We're going to pass in the text here is going to be title and did we have that as a string already no I do not see the title in there so let's extract him and we're gonna do the same kind of thing for uh, description Extract string resource. There we go. And now let's actually do the displays. And the text here is going to be movie.title. And this one's going to be movie.description. And that should give us a nice little movie. Uh, oops, that's a movie edit I'd put there. Let's move this up to movie display. Let's try running that, and hopefully when we click on a movie, we'll actually see the content. So here's our list. Click on the movie. Ta-da! We have a title with the title, description with the description. If I hit back, I can go and choose a different one. I'm going to choose a different one. And so now we're on our way to actually having a working application here. What we're going to do next is set it up so we have a toolbar on here, and the toolbar will help us edit these things by having a little edit icon and then also later on we can add in the functionality to do the multi select on the list to add a toolbar we can take advantage of a scaffolding component and the way this works is the scaffold allows you to plug in what you want for the toolbar what you want for the content and what you want for some other areas of the screen like if you want to have a navigation drawer that slides out so this is a special type of layout that manages those pieces and we get to fill them in so let's go back up to our movie list and let's try to add in a little scaffold here. So what I'm going to do is around all of this, 
I'm going to say scaffold. And I'm going to get rid of these parentheses because we're actually going to have multiple lambdas that we want to fill in explicitly as parameters. So I'm going to come into the parameter list. And first of all, we have a top bar. This is a lambda defining what goes at the top of the application. That's going to be our toolbar area. And then we have a content area that we're going to care about. And that's going to be all of this stuff down below. So I'm just going to take all of this and move it up here into content. I think I need one more curly. I didn't copy enough curlies there. So that's the main content part of the screen. And now we need to define the top bar. So in this top bar section, we're going to say, I want to use a top app bar. And inside there, I'm going to define a title and some actions to perform. On our main screen, the action is just going to be creating a new movie. It's not going to be doing anything else, unless we're in multi-select mode, in which case the actions will have that delete button that we're going to need to delete our, our um, movies from the list. But let's just start off just putting a title in here. So the title is going to be some text at the top. And I'm just going to say movies. Let's go ahead and extract that string resource as well. Boom. So that's going to be the title up at the top of the bar. And the actions, we're just going to want a single action to represent adding a new movie. We can do that using an icon button. And he's going to have an on-click action. We'll fill that in in a second. And then inside of there, we'll have an icon that goes on the icon button. Now Jetpack Compose comes with several built-in icons that we can use. So we can start by saying icons dot filled because we want to have it be just not just an outline but a filled icon dot add and that's going to give us our little plus to add things to the, the screen now it's not necessarily going to have all of the icons we might want to use so what we may want to do is add in something into the drawable like we did for our little movie icons over here and then you can reference those the same type of way where we brought in that resource so I'm going to say it's the add icon that we're going to use and what are the parameter names on this guy? So he's an image vector. Let's see what he can take as an image vector. So just image vector is the name of the icon. That's nice and easy. And let's get him out of the way so we can actually see what we're doing. And let's give it a content description as well. And this is going to be, let's say, yeah, add movie will be good. And we'll extract that string resource as well. And now we should have a nice little add button on the top. Now we don't have it doing anything yet, but basically what this is going to need to do is create a new movie and launch the edit screen for that movie. But we don't want to do these actions actually at this point in the code. We really want the data management to happen outside. Anytime you think of that to yourself that, oh, I want this to happen outside, it means you need to create another functional parameter up here. So we have our on click. We can have on add movie as well. Don't need any arguments. Don't need to get any return values. So inside here, we'll say on add movie. And just notify the caller that we need to add a movie at that point. Boom. Now let's go down and do something similar in our movie display. So I'm going to copy this same kind of code here with the content and everything for the scaffold. Come down to this guy, put our scaffold in, let this column with the data being displayed be the actual content, and then let's figure out what has to happen up here. So for the title on this guy we're going to say whatever the current movie name is so i'm going to say text equals movie dot title we'll just have that at the top of the screen then for our button on the toolbar here it's going to be for editing so we can come in here and add an edit button as well and we're going to change this one to say 
edit movie. Extract that string resource as well. And then this is going to become on edit movie. Now on edit movie, we're going to have to tell the caller which movie is being edited here. So we're going to pass that movie in. And let's say on edit movie is going to take a movie and do something with it. We don't care about a return value for it. So that should set up the appropriate scaffolding for both of those. Now let's just see. I think we're missing one curly brace for the end of this scaffold here, or actually it's a parenthesis for the end of the scaffold definition. And then we're eventually going to do the same thing for these other screens. But one thing to note is as we do this, we're starting to see some kind of similar functionality in some places here especially in things like setting up an actual button to do things. We can create some helper functions to do this and make this a lot simpler. Because the things we care about are the function to call, the vector to use, and the actual string that we want to display uh, for the, uh, the content description there. The rest of that is just all boilerplate. But we'll take care of that in a minute. Let's go ahead and try running this to see how it looks. Oops, we have movies in there twice. So don't think we're going to need to have movies in there twice. Let's go ahead and delete one of them. Bring out my emulator. No value passed for on clicked in the movie list. That's, we actually need an on click and an add movie. Right now it thinks the lambda outside is for on add movie. So because I have these two lambdas in here now, I'm really going to want to put those inside the parentheses in the call. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to say on click equals this stuff. And we'll just indent that a bit. And then we're going to have on add movie equals we'll deal with that later. Let's get rid of these two breakpoints. I don't think we're going to need those right now. And I think we're also going to have that with the movie display. We're going to have on edit movie. And we'll deal with that detail a little bit later. Let's go ahead and run it. And now we've got our movie screen. Note that we now have this plus button up in the top on the toolbar, and the toolbar says movies. If I go into a movie, I'm now seeing the movie name and an edit button. This gives us our framework to do a little bit more navigation, so we can actually go into the edit screen next. So before we jump into that definition, let's just go ahead and take care of what these functions should do. So on add movie, we're going to need to create a movie and then move to that movie. Now creating a movie is going to involve putting some stuff into the database, which means that we should be doing it in a coroutine. So what we really want to do inside here is call some functions in the view model inside a coroutine, which means we need a way to start a coroutine. So up here at the top of this, I'm going to say val scope equals remember coroutine scope to get a launcher for our coroutines. Then what I can do in add movie is say scope.launch and let's launch this on dispatchers.io. Now we don't have to do that. We could actually have the called function do that for us. Let's, uh, what we need to do in here is create a movie. And then do a view model dot push movie edit screen passing in that new movie that we've created. So let's figure out how we're going to create that movie. This is going to be something that's going to run in a coroutine, and we want to make sure it runs in a coroutine. So we're going to make it a suspend function inside of our view model. So let's go to our movie view model. And we don't currently have a create. So let's say suspend fun, create movie. And this is going to be repository.insert passing in some movie that we create. So let's create a movie here. Let's say movie with title is empty and description is empty. 
And we're going to let that movie create his own ID. If we go into his definition, we'll see that primary key has a default value for the ID. So we're going to let it create that default value, which is guaranteed to be unique because it's a UUID. So this will insert a movie. However, the way I've written it, it actually isn't quite right because we want to get a movie back. If we take a look at this, repository.insert inserts a movie that already exists. So this is one of those cases where we want to use apply inside Kotlin. I'm going to cut that movie out there and say movie title and do some initialization for it. And we'll say insert this, just like that. There we go. So what this is going to do is the return value is going to be this movie that we create, but we're going to insert it into the database as part of our initialization. And then the result of this apply is that this value. So it's going to be the movie itself. Take the movie, pass it in as this, and then return it. So that way we can actually just return that movie. Because it's a suspend function, it has to be run inside of a coroutine. Uh, actually, we should be putting this in the repository. So I'm going to say repository create movie. So let's pull him out. And let's go to our repository. And let's add a suspend fun create movie, which returns a movie. And then inside our actual code here, this is where we're going to do what we just had. Whoops. I want to make sure I copy that piece of code there, and we will just paste that in here. And we'll just call insert. Now in this case, we can actually put that with context here as well, just to be consistent with what else we've been doing. Only need one equal sign though. And he needs an override in front of it, and now we're good. So now we have a function to create that movie. It automatically switches that dispatcher. So from our main activity, we can just say viewmodel.createMovie, just like that, and boom, we have a movie. And we don't need this dispatcher being specified on the launch because we're taking care of that in the create movie. This will end up pushing the new screen, which should put us on the edit screen to let us finish changing the movie at that point. Now for edit movie, it's a little bit simpler. All we need to do down here is the same push with whatever the current movie is. So it'd be screen.movie. And now let's go define our, edit, our movie edit screen. The user interface. Let's grab a copy of the scaffolding again. And we'll go down to our movie edit, paste in our scaffolding, kind of like that. And let's take a look at what we need on the edit. Now the edit isn't going to need anything on the toolbar as far as toolbar buttons. So I don't need this action set, set, uh, stuff there. We'll go ahead and use the movie title, so I'll say text equals movie.title, but if the movie title is blank, we probably want to put the words no title or something up there so that when you first come in, you can kind of see that, oh, the toe bar isn't blank, it's actually still representing the movie. So we can do that kind of like this, val title equals if movie.title is whoops not blank and can movie title be null nope okay so if it's not blank then movie.title else we'll put in parentheses no title something like that let's extract him and there we go 
So that gives me a title that I can just put inside of here at the top, depending on if it's blank or not. Now this is a little cotton, by the way. If you find yourself doing something very similar to this a lot with the strings, what we can do is define something like fun string. So we're going to create an extension function on string, not blank or. And then what we'll do is we'll have this, this uh, function be either return the string itself if it's not blank or something else. Alternate string. And then that is just going to be the same kind of thing. So if this is not blank, we can just say that not blank, return this, else alternate. And now we can change the code up here to just be movie title not blank or string resource yada yada yada. Now we can make this a little bit more efficient by instead of evaluating this string resource every single time, we actually make it a lambda that will evaluate the string resource if that's the case. So we could say alternate is a lambda that returns a string and then just call it. And if we do that, the code ends up looking like this. And that's a composable, so we have to make sure that that alternate is a composable function, which means that this function here must be composable just because of the way I'm doing this. And so now we have this nice little movie title if it's not blank or evaluate the string resource. So there's a couple approaches you could take on that. Nothing wrong with the first approach of putting the explicit if else in there yourself. Uh, this just wanted to show you a couple alternatives. So now we've got our top app bar. Let's look at what type of content we have in here. So once again, we want to have a column where we have modifier. Whoops, I meant to put that in parentheses. Equals vertical scroll. Remember scroll state. And then inside here, we'll set up a couple text fields that will actually do the, the work of letting us edit things. So we'll say text field. And we have a value and an on change. So let's see, the value is going to be uh, the, for the first one, the movie.title. And then on value change, we're going to want to change the value being passed in there. To do this, we're just going to want to pass it on out to the caller. So let's make a call back here. Say on movie change, something like that. Pass the movie back up with the change inside of it. So this will be on movie change. And because the movie is a data class, I can say movie.copy and just change the title. Title equals it. And we just need to put that inside curly braces. So the value as it changes gets passed in here, and then we can update the title in the actual movie. What we're doing though is actually creating a brand new movie with a new title and the existing description. We can do the same kind of thing for the description. Like that. And we're going to want to have a label defined on this. So I'm going to say label equals, let's give it a text. And we'll say text equals string resource r.string dot should be title, and we need a comma there. There we go. And then the same kind of thing here for, whoops, description. Let's add in some padding around these. So we'll have modifier equals modifier dot padding. 8 dot dp is usually good. Come down here, do the same thing. 
And now we should have a nice little form that lets us edit the text. Once again, we can create some common helpers because you'll notice that these two look very, very similar in how they're set up. And we're just changing a couple pieces like the value here, the resource string here, and the block of code to execute there. That's not a whole lot of code. If there's other things that we might want this text field to do, we may want to have a helper function. But at this point, we might not really need it yet. So hopefully this will actually end up calling this on movie change. So now we need to decide what do we do when the movie changes. So let's go back to our main activity up here. We'll see where the error is because we just added this new function for the movie edit screen. And this is when the movie changes. Actually, let's just put it inside the parentheses because I like, I like naming these. So on movie change, we have the movie coming in as it. We could, of course, rename it. Now we need to tell the view model to save that. So view model dot update movie. So let's make sure that we have that kind of function now. We'll go back into our view model. We don't have an update movie function yet. So let's create a update movie movie equals repository update movie which means that we're going to have to define it in our repository because it's obviously not there yet. So we'll go to our repository, go to the base there, add in our update. Not sure why I didn't have those in. Movies, movie, and actors, actor. So we have those updates. Let's put them in here as well. with overrides and we'll add in a with context dispatchers.io and inside there db.dao.update movies. Now once again we get into this issue with the var args. If we have a var arg being passed in, we need to spread it back out, which just pretends that there's commas in between again. And we'll do the same kind of thing here for the actors, just like that. So that should allow us to update things. Now, if this all works, we should see the data saved. So when we go back out, it gets updated on the previous screens. Let's see what it's not liking inside here. Update should only be called from a coroutine or suspend function. Ah, so because we're calling update from this lambda, this lambda has to be a suspend function. So I'm going to go into movies edit, and on movie change, I'm going to change this to be suspend movie blah, blah, blah. And now down here, when we're doing this change, we're going to need to do it from a coroutine. So inside here, we can ch change this to, we're going to need a scope. So we can either pass a coroutine scope in from above, or we can create another coroutine scope here. I'm just going to pass it in from above. that'll let it keep running when we switch as we're switching uh, between view parts. If we actually defined a remember coroutine inside of here, when we don't have the movie edit displayed anymore, that coroutine gets canceled. So there's actually a little chance that we would cancel the cancel the actual change of the data as we're moving out of the movie edit. So it'd be best to pass it in and let the parent keep that coroutine running. So down in here, I'm going to say scope dot launch pass in on movie change there we go and then we can do the same thing down here while I was editing this video I realized that I actually could have started that coroutine inside that on movie change lambda that was passed in here 
So in the repository, you'll see that I've actually changed that. On movie changes, no longer a suspend function, and the caller is actually starting the coroutine. That way I have all my coroutine calls starting in the same place. So let's go ahead and try this and see what happens. I'm going to run him. And if I'm really lucky, this will work. Apparently I wasn't lucky enough. I forgot something. So what did I miss? No value pass for parameter scope. Oh, I didn't pass the scope down inside there. So I'm going to say scope equals scope. And that should take care of him. Let's try that one more time. And that's looking pretty good. So now we have our movies. Let's try creating a movie. So boom. Now we're actually inside here. Notice there's no title. I'm going to start typing a title. And I'll say, oh, the wind. Uh-oh. I'm typing and nothing is happening. Why is that? Let's go into the movie edit and take a little bit of a closer look. So let's think about what movie object is actually being passed in here. That's really the core of our problem. If we come back up to where movie edit's being called from, he's being passed in screen.movie. Now think about this for a minute. Inside this movie edit, we're actually creating a brand new movie each time by saying movie.copy. That's not changing the movie that's kept inside the screen instance. So it keeps passing us back that same instance over and over again. So this creates a little bit of a problem for us. Because it's passing in the same instance, we're never updating our user interface. So this is one of those cases where we got to think of, okay, either we're going to need to re-look up that movie object every single time it changes, or we're going to need to keep track of this title and description separately as internal state inside this function. And that's really going to be the way we want to do it. So what we're going to end up doing is create internal state for title and description, update those, but also call this on movie change. So the on movie change is going to update the data in the database, but it's not going to change that object in the screen. So that's something we have to be a little bit careful about. And what that also means is when we go back to the display page, it's not going to see the object be updated. So we got to try to think about how to do that. Let's first of all take a look at keeping track of the data using some uh, remember fields inside here. So if we come up to the top here and say var title by remember, and then inside here we'll say mutable state of movie.title. So we'll initialize it to the actual movie title. And then we'll do the same thing for the description. Kind of like that. Now these guys are going to need the get value. We're going to need to import those guys because they haven't been imported yet. And then down here on the title on the toolbar, we're going to need to set up what that title should be. So I'm going to say title, not blank or no title. So we're just going to use whatever that value of the title is. And actually let's take this and just put it right there so we don't have that redefinition. Whoops. Oh, that's not in a composable function there. So we're going to need to do, let's say, uh, toolbar title. And we'll put that there. And then we're going to come down here and actually change it. So instead of the value being displayed coming from that movie every single time, which isn't changing, we're just going to grab it from that uh, internal state. In our on change, I'm going to say title equals it. And we don't have to do that inside the coroutine. What's nice about that is that this happens live very quickly. The coroutine kicks off to actually go and do a database change there. So let's see, now we'll do the same type of thing with description. And we'll say description equals it. And so what this is going to do is this should allow us to have those fields be edited on the screen. So let's try this out and see if we actually see the edits. So we'll go in, we'll create a new movie. Hello, Dolly. 
stuff happens. It's a musical. Okay. And now when I go back, you notice how the actual title got updated as I typed it and these descriptions and everything's fine there. If I go back though, it's blank. Let's see what happens if we try displaying that. Notice the title is still blank there. Let's try editing it and see what happens. Come back out of here. Now the title actually got saved. So why is this happening? Let's take a look at what the code is doing once again. We get a movie passed in to movie edit. And that movie starts off with both fields blank. Then what we're doing is we're updating a copy with the title and the description stays blank. And here we're updating it with a, descrip with a description and the title stays blank. So as we were typing the title, it was saving the movie over and over with the title getting updated and the description being blank. As we were changing the description, it was updating the description without actually changing, with it actually storing a blank title because it was kept copying the original movie. So the first thing we look at is we say we can't do the movie.copy because we keep using the old value, one of which is blank. So whichever field you're editing, you're always going to get the other ones replaced by the, the, the existing data that came into the function. So we really need to create a brand new movie object here. We can say title equals that, description equals description. And then we can come down here and say title equals title, description equals it, and that should make sure they both get updated together. So let's try running that. We're going to create a brand new uh, a brand new movie and see if it'll actually save the data correctly. We'll hit a plus here to create a new movie. And I should note that uh, while I paused the video, I went up to the top of the main activity. I added in this little launched effect at the, set at, top, at the top of set content to reset the database each time because I realized I wasn't resetting the database when I restarted the application. So this is actually clearing the data, reinserting all that dummy data each time we run it. You're obviously not going to want this in your real application, but it's helpful to actually clear out any type of problems we have each time. Because I, I stopped the video for a moment, did a, a couple little checks just to make sure it was doing what I thought it was doing, and then started the video back up again, but I needed to clean the database. So now let's see if I can add a new movie in here. Let's call it Star Trek 2 Description the good one. And now we'll come out of here and note that this movie in the list has not been updated. Let's try clicking on it and notice that all the data is blank again. And there's a pretty good reason for that. If I come down to that movie edit screen one more time, notice that I created a new movie with a title and description, but I didn't specify the ID. When you do that, I get a new ID every single time. So I'm not actually updating the one that was added to the database. I'm creating a brand new movie every time, and we don't want to do that. So what I really need to do is say ID equals movie.id in each one of these. And now that should make this work. So I'm going to rerun it. That'll reset the database again, make it all nice and clean. And let's add a new one here. Let's try Star Trek again. Star Trek 2, the good one. We'll come back out of here. And now, boom, there's Star Trek 2. If I click on it, boom, everything's just fine. And now if I go to edit it, I should be able to say Star Trek 3 and come in here, ugh. And now I'll come back out. And now the data on this screen is still showing the old movie that we passed in. So we've got some issues here we need to figure out. We were able to set up that screen to work okay, but it still didn't cause our, solve our problem of that old movie being held onto by the movie display object. And this is where you get into a little bit of a curse blessing scenario when you're using immutable objects. Usually with immutable objects, you're going to have copies of them sitting around. And when you change them, you have to create a brand new object. If anything else is still pointing to that old object, you're going to have stale data, which is exactly what we're seeing here. So the easiest way to fix this 
is to, instead of passing the actual movie object along with those screen definitions, we just pass the ID of the movie along. And what that means then is that whenever we go inside a screen, we're going to have to look the data up before we go inside the screen so that we can pass the correct data in. So let's make that change, and that should fix this problem. Give ourselves a little room to work. So let's take a look at our screen definitions, which is inside of our view model. And instead of actually passing the movie, I'm going to say pass in the movie ID, which is a string. And, whoops, we'll do the same thing here. And this is going to be actor ID, which is a string. And then actor, which is a string. And don't get me wrong, doing immutable data is really the right thing to do here. But it's really easy, if you're not careful, to get a stale object sitting around. So now we've got all that happening there this get movie function is going to become very important now. So if we take a look in our repository get movie, which is calling the DAO get movie, let's just double check that definition. We'll see here that this is a synchronous call. So this has to happen from a coroutine that we define. So let's go back to our UE. And actually I want to go to the main activity. And now we're going to see a whole lot of errors because now we're not passing those movies along. So when we pass these along, it's going to be pushing in the movie ID to the movie edit screen. And then here, movie edit screen, it's going to be screen dot movie ID. And let's see, is there any other ones here? So actor, let me actually comment these ones out for the moment. And we'll come back up here. We need to look this up before we can actually pass it into the movie display. But how can we do that? At this point, we're just trying to add nodes to the tree. We can't delay that adding nodes to the tree at this point. We actually have to put nodes in the tree. And what that means is we're going to really have to pass that movie ID into the movie display itself and then have the movie display look it up. But we need to provide the code for how to look it up. We can't have the movie display do the lookup itself. So let's go into him. And this is going to be changed to be movie ID, which is a string. On edit movie is going to pass in a string for the movie ID as well. And we need some way to actually look up the movie here. So we're going to pass in a get movie function, which is going to take a string and then return a unit. But the guts of that code is going to have to call a coroutine. So we're going to have to make it a suspend function. We're also going to need some kind of a scope to start that coroutine. That's where launch defect is going to come in. We're going to have, as we compose this, it's going to go and look up the movie for us. So to make all this work, what we've got in our movie display is I can say var movie by Remember, so we're going to create a slot in the tree, mutable state of, and we'll say movie question mark, so it'll be nullable. And then we're going to start a launch defect to go fetch that. We're going to key this on the movie ID. So if the movie ID changes, we're going to cancel the work that we're doing to look it up and then restart. So what we do inside here, this is a coroutine that got started. We're going to say movie equals get movie passed in movie ID. And whoops, I specified this wrong. This should be a movie. So this will, in that coroutine, go kick off a lookup for the movie using the function we passed in. And then once it's ready, set the movie here. Let's look at the rest of this function here. Notice that movie is now nullable because it might not be ready to start with. So what we want to do is when this first starts, start out with a screen that the user can't edit until we have a movie to fill in the details. So what we're going to do 
but we'll keep our top app bar. But in the content here, I'm going to say if movie is null, then text loading extract string resource for loading else the actual user interface. So this is how easy it is to do that loading. So one thing we got to be careful of though is because this is a by remember where it's a mutable state and changing, we need to keep track of the actual movie object. So it, it, we're going to have to basically make a capture of its current value. To do that, it's probably easiest to just do a let here. None. I'll just use it is fine. We'll move this up here. Change it from movie to it. And then we're going to have otherwise, we're going to run. And run is another one of these scoping functions. We're just going to use this to just execute some code. So now, if the movie is not null, we're going to get its data and, and work with it. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and do the loading screen. Now we have to do our title the same way that we did before in the edit screen. So if I come down to the edit screen and just copy this title, and I'll bring them up here. And so this is going to be a mutable state of, started off as a blank string. And once we actually have a movie, we can compute that value. Now, in order to do this, it might be easiest to just recompute in the remember. So I can say whenever there's the movie changes, then I'm going to recalculate movie title as the actual title there. And if it's null, I will say no title, something like that. So if I don't have a movie, actually, no movie selected. Or movie loading, we'll do that. Movie loading, because the movie, the movie in this case is null. Okay, so that should have our title. I can now replace this down here. And now in this on edit movie, we want the movie ID passed out to say that we want to edit that movie. And poof, our movie display should be set. Now this actually doesn't need to be a var because we're never actually going to set it. We're just going to calculate it using this anytime the movie changes. So now down to our movie edit. Let's see if we can fix him up. This guy needs to take in a movie ID as a string. And we're going to look them up the same way that we did before up here. So let's come up here and I'm just going to grab those lines, paste them in. And I'm going to actually, I want to keep the title the way it is and description. And we're going to do the same kind of thing for looking up the title and description whenever the movie changes. And actually, this title is going to be the empty string one. Because before, we were just using it for the, we were only using it for the toolbar title up at this point. Now we're actually using these to track what the user types in. So we don't want that to say no text or anything like that. So this guy needs a Git movie as well. Let's copy him. So we will look that movie up whenever the movie ID changes. So that means we'll only look them up once if the movie doesn't change. We're using these temporaries to display things. And if we come back to a screen, it'll reload that. That'll take care of our going back to that display screen. So let's see what else we need inside here. So this guy, we're going to be changing. Oh, I have him to be a, a var. These need to be vars and not vals. So we'll initialize them anytime the movie's reloaded. And now we've got the movie ID here being passed through. Let's just put that in that way and set this guy up. And I think we're golden. These just don't do any, these aren't used yet. That's why I'm coming up yellow. 
So let's go back to our main activity. And now we need to fix this up a little bit here. So in the movie display, we're going to say movie ID equals screen.movieID. And same thing here. And what's the problem up here? We're going to push the movie display screen. So we have a movie that was clicked on inside the movie list. I want to say it.id to display it. And now we actually need to also pass in the get movie function. And this is going to take an ID and it's going to return view model dot get movie passing in the ID. And we're going to do the same kind of thing for the movie edit screen like that. And these ones here, let me just put a dummy text in here just to make these compile OK. And then I will fill this stuff in a little bit later. Let's try this now. So it's going to reset the database. Keep that in mind. Now let's create a new movie. And I will say Star Wars Han Shot First. That sounds like a good one. Come back out of there. And now we have Star Wars. If I go to display it, boom. If I go to edit it, Star Wars Episode 4. Come back out. And boom. The data actually got updated because now we're refetching that after we've updated it in the database. So now we have an application that's working a lot more consistently. In the next set, in the next module, we're going to take a look at how we can deal with selection in the list to do some more interesting things there, as well as fix a little bug. And I'm just going to let you see what this bug looks like. Hopefully, by the time you see this video in a future class, this bug won't exist anymore. But at this point, there's actually a bug. If I come in here, notice that when I come in here and start editing and then hit back, first back takes the keyboard away. That's expected. The second back removes focus from the field. It doesn't actually exit this screen. So we're going to want to try to fix that bug. Hopefully that will actually be fixed in a, in a soon version of Jetpack Compose. We're only at 102 at the point of me recording this video, but I'm hoping that Later on, that'll be fixed. In the next module, we'll talk about how you can end up fixing that. Uh, and it's not a hard thing. We just have to handle the back button ourselves a little bit more explicitly.